I was in San Francisco for AMD's Data Center and AI event, live with Lisa Sue on stage, and I've got a lot to talk about. AMD is launching new Epic processors for the Data Center. Milan X, with lots of cash, and better camo with 128 CPU cores. Okay, I don't know what was going on there, but the CPU stuff is awesome and I'm here for that, but today, today I wanna talk about the interface side of things. I mean, the fastest CPUs on the market is not gonna be enough if you can't feed them, right? And that's what Pensando and Xilinx is all about for AMD. I mean, you gotta keep those cores fed. Getting data in and out, we gotta go fast, but we also have to shuttle data in and out fast as well. I've got our Falcon Northwest workstation here, but I've equipped it with 100 gigabit ethernet because I have a better understanding now, about a year later, of how both Pensando and Xilinx will sort of bring AMD's strategic vision to life. And I gotta say, I see the plan taking shape and it has a broader appeal than what I would have guessed from a year ago. It's basically drop-in ready. It's an even broader approach than what NVIDIA is doing with Bluefield, and dare I say, AMD looks like it's positioning itself better in the market than NVIDIA has for general purpose compute. So today, I wanna to talk about Pensando DPUs, and yes, they're calling it DPUs now on the website. Check that out, that's pretty awesome, because you know before they were accelerators or you know, uh, smart NICs, that kind of thing. But they're not just smart NICs. I mean, if you've got a few dozen servers that you manage or more, you really want to look into Pensando and play with them because you might be surprised, as I was, at the kinds of things that are possible here. All right, look at Azure's infrastructure slide. 22 core savings, 30 cores versus eight cores. I mean, this seems absurd, right? I mean, when you break it down, this slide looks like something that was lost in translation with the marketing department. In, in what world does it make sense that this is how this works? And so I started peeling back the layers of linoleum to find out what was going on here. And not only is this slide accurate, I can actually demonstrate for you how this works in, in pleb tier land here at level one techs. And you could actually run this yourself, which is why I said, hey, if you only manage a dozen or so servers, this is so game changing that you really should take a look at this. I think AMD is able to do this because of their partnership with Microsoft and Azure, HP Enterprise, and VMware. Because they were doing these kinds of things with VMware, but VMware is a little bit special sauce and not everybody's ready to drink the VMware Lemonade if you're not already drinking the VMware Lemonade or the VMware Kool-Aid, depending on what flavor of the week it is. So I can show you this now. The future is already here. You can literally just go out and buy it and start experimenting with it now. You don't need anything special. This isn't coming down the pike. This is literally these devices are in market now and HP Enterprise Aruba, they've already built products around it and oh, let's just, let's dive in. All right, our Falcon Northwest system. This is rocking 56 cores. This is the highest single core clock speed in PCIe 5 that you can get right now, which is gonna be important for my demonstration because we get a feed that aforementioned 100 gig network. Our network, it's so fast, 100 gigabits per second, it's 16 PCIe lanes wide. Most of you don't have an SSD that can write at 100 gigabit, in other words, let alone the entire rest of the computer is able to keep up with 100 gigabit. And yet in the beginning, that's how Ethernet was. Ethernet oftentimes was a lot faster than the host system they were plugged into, at least in the early days of Ethernet. But for now, for these NICs, these are arguably the best NICs in the industry, or at least they were before the NVIDIA acquisition. This is a Mellanox Connect X5. We've got Connect X5 and six uh, NICs that are set up in these machines. And 100 gigabit basically doesn't automatically mean that your application will run at 100 gigabit. Yet there's 100 gigabits of link speed available. I mean, look, look here in Windows. It's a 100 gigabit link. And our disk benchmark showing that this platform can manage 16 gigabytes per second right speed, right performance here. So we've really juiced things. This is really high end in the server. So you just plug this in to your workstation and it shows a hundred gigabit. And so it's just gonna work, right? Well, that's definitely not the case. The other end is a PCIe 5 system. It's definitely not a Gen 5 Threadripper system, let me tell you. But it's really fast, just like this one. And so you'd expect to see 10 gigabytes per second plus from just a Windows copyright because both of these systems are showing 100 gigabit. When we drag the file, why is it only running at about 25 gigabit, 30 gigabit, something like that? Uh, it's gotta be our switch, right? We just, okay, we'll plug this machine directly into the other machine. There's not even a switch now. This Mellanox is connected to the other Mellanox. That's gonna change things, right? No, it's, it's still basically the same. Now check this out. 
one of our CPU cores is pegged while we're doing that copy. And we're using RDMA, receive side scaling. Uh, there's a bunch of options in the Mellanox driver, like when you look at the properties for offloading the checksums and offloading receive size scaling and large send offloads and receive offloads and buffers. And all of this is working fine, believe it or not, but this isn't anywhere near the theoretical max of full 100 gigabit. The problem here is the size of the data packets on the network is making just too many of them the sheer number of teeny tiny little packets on the network by default overwhelm our systems. That's why the CPU's pegged and that's why even though these are the fastest single thread performance we get and with our network settings, we're actually running multiple queues in parallel across multiple cores, we still get 100% pegged CPU cores. And yeah, the inefficiency of the Windows file copy is playing a role here too. It's definitely working against us. But even just a year ago, it was challenging for Windows to be this well behaved to copying a file anywhere remotely this fast. I mean, a file copy at three gigabytes per second, you should probably run out and buy 25 gig network cards for all of your high end workstations immediately if you're not already. Okay, spoiler alert, if we change the default 1500 byte packet size to 9000 bytes pretty much immediately, we're good to go. It's gonna be less overhead, it's gonna be fixed forever, right? Okay, yeah, we can get closer to, to 10 gigabytes per second, 100 gigabit with that, but we're still gonna have 100% pegged CPU utilization, and that's not something that even our 9,000 byte packet will solve. And I've got worse news. The internet infrastructure at large, it's also about 1,500 bytes for the packet size. 1,500 bytes for the packet size on something that broad, and you wanna change the internet to have a larger packet and, and regain some of these efficiencies for large file transfers or, or better latency or whatever, well, I've got some bad news. Changing that packet size on the internet would be almost as much headache as changing the fine structure constant of the universe in order to get the answer you want, and that's not something we can easily do. <laughs> Plus you're a member of the continuum. This is just to show you that dealing with thousands and millions and billions of tiny 1500 byte packets is just overwhelming. Now remember Microsoft's 30 cores versus eight cores to service the same traffic. Let's look at the architecture for level one techs because it's really similar to this and it's really similar to what we're looking at here. So to understand a little bit better about what a Pensando DPU can do for you in this situation, okay, yeah, all right, let's, let's take a look at the new level one text website. Uh, it's based on Drupal, which is one of the best and largest open source content management systems available. But Drupal by itself, not super amazing. It needs, needs some love. Drupal is written in PHP, which is a, not necessarily a fast programming language. And Drupal itself is so complicated that it runs kind of slow, even when it's fast. And we want it to be fast, so we put something in front of it called Varnish. And Varnish in front of Drupal, uh, okay, it was actually designed to be fast, and so Varnish is actually fast. And PHP as a programming language is not by itself set up to service web requests and that sort of thing. It doesn't do all of the stuff that a web server does, but it is designed to interface with a web server, although you can run it at the command line. So we have another piece of software called Nginx, and Nginx talks to Varnish and then that sort of thing. And Nginx is built to be fast, unlike PHP and Drupal, but Nginx doesn't do all the things that Varnish does and Varnish doesn't do all the things that Nginx does. And we also need the traffic to be encrypted because this is the internet after all, so we need SSL encryption. So, okay, even before I show you the amazing new level one text website, we have all of this plumbing necessary in order to just get it on the internet. SSL, Nginx, Varnish, and the PHP interface. Who wants to manage all of that? Because I only want to work on the website part of it. I don't want to work on all this other infrastructure. Well. Managing that complexity with infrastructure as code is sort of becoming in vogue. And I promise this is gonna get to Pensando DPUs in just a second. Here's an example of our stack implemented with Docker. It doesn't have to be implemented with Docker. It could be implemented with literally anything else, Kubernetes. We could do it on a Google Compute Cloud, literally anything. But here's our Docker setup. So we just do a Docker PS and we see our infrastructure running here. Each one of these is like a virtual machine if you want to think of it like that, if you're not read in on the whole containerization thing, but more correctly, they're each Docker containers. They're, they each have little minds of their own and they're all doing their own little thing. And so the work here uh, is, is pretty clean and there's a surprisingly small amount of overhead given the fact that these are basically separate containers doing their own thing. 
We have an Nginx container. That's the first one in the stack, the first one you encounter when you're on the internet. And that one has our encryption certificate and it handles SSL. So when you connect to the web server, it sets up that SSL connection. It also does some security filtering and some other things like that. That container is the first one that takes traffic from the internet and reassembles it into requests and then decides what to do with it. Next in the stack is a varnish container. If you make it past that one, the, the traffic is passed unencrypted to a varnish container and varnish looks at what it has to decide if it has a cache resource or no. A static file, an image file, something that it can serve from you know, a CDN, and then it will return that to you if it's from the cache. If it's not in the cache, then it'll go to the next layer of the stack, which is another Nginx process running PHP. Now, it might seem like not the great the greatest idea to run two Nginx's, but from a security and separation standpoint, it's really nice to be able to have PHP and Nginx in this context running from a different security setup than the first one. And this one will actually execute PHP code. And there is actually some stuff in here that will cache PHP and cache PHP files that are read from the file system and can deal with logged in users versus anonymous users, whereas Varnish can only deal with anonymous users. And that has to do with the particular setup of the application for this Nginx container and this PHP proxy. And strictly speaking, PHP running as a separate process could also be another container in the stack, depending on how you want to do scaling and everything else. So it can get even a little bit more complicated. Of all of the resources and everything that is being slung about here, when we just load the new level one text webpage, you get CSS files, you get JavaScript files, you get image files. Most of those are gonna come from cache. The actual page itself, now nah, that might not come from cache. Oh, and there's one other container here if you look at the, the, the list here that I haven't named. This one only exists, its sole purpose in life is to start up once a day, check whether the encryption certificate, the SSL certificate for the website, the public facing part, is expiring. If it is expiring within two weeks, then it will renew the SSL certificates, replacing the ones that are expiring with new fresh SSL certificates so that the SSL certificates are maintained. This is really nice. It just runs, does its thing, and then ex exits. So this runs in parallel to the rest of the infrastructure. But this is really nice because it's not just sitting around soaking up resources all the time. I mean, all this is great. You, you know, it's a very, you know, very cool show and tell day, but what does this have to do with Pensando? Okay, so think about this in terms of infrastructure as code. I'm running AMD's latest and greatest Bergamo, let's say. And as a developer, I'm really only most concerned with what you're experiencing on the Level 1 Text website. I really don't care about all of this plumbing. I don't care about setting up the SSL certificate. I don't care about any of that. But to do business on the internet, I have to care about all of that. I have to set up SSL. I have to manage the certificates. I have to manage all of the plumbing and caching infrastructure that leads to the application. This is just part of life on the internet. And I would like to maximize the amount of server resources that are actually going to the actual web app. Now in the past, companies like Palo Alto and F5 Networks could sell you a product that you put on your network and it would handle the SSL part of this and it would handle all that and then it would pass the traffic to your ap actual application server. But servers are so powerful now and things like the Pensando DPUs are available that you are kind of inconvenienced now having that kind of infrastructure because you can't manage this as infrastructure as code. I mean, this is, it's great. You made your server go fast because you bought those products, but it's just not as convenient because you have to configure those products and that's a separate process than configuring my application and doing all this in a sane way. So back to our Docker setup. If we look at this from the command line, I can start, stop, restart all those containers. I'm controlling and managing the full infrastructure from the time it touches an individual to the time that it's servicing the request. And this is all in one file. This one file defines all of this infrastructure. It doesn't have to be one file. You can get really complicated with it. I'm just showing you that this is a really nice way to manage this. I can even populate a database, connect to an Amazon RDS instance, you name it from this one file. And this defines our infrastructure. It's a text file. You can manage it with Git, version control, whatever. It's fabulous. Okay, yeah, I'm glossing over a few things. This configuration file would actually define some VLANs, external IP addresses, a whole bunch more parameters, but the point is all of that can be managed in a text file. This is the nut that AMD has cracked so elegantly with both Pensando and Xilinx that I had to make this video and show you because you can manage their stuff exactly the way that you are today with your infrastructure as code or move into infrastructure as code using this process. Oh, and let's not forget about VMware. VMware is its own sort of set of technologies that abstract some of this away. VMware has a whole bunch of stuff that they load on the P4 processor to let you run you know, 
VXLAN and remote LAN and cluster stuff. And I mean, there's entire branches of this technology tree that have to do with packet flow management and third party enterprise products for managing all of this stuff. But a lot of that complexity is going away or being replaced with simpler complexity, more top down software component managed stuff. So I don't really want to get into that, but VMware actually does see the writing on the wall here and their products like Tanzu are meant to sort of dovetail with this kind of functionality and remove this abstraction for things that you have to worry about. So again, I as a developer can just worry about my application and import the little pieces of plumbing that I need in order to get from A to B. But that's VMware on their side of things. Bizondo DPU has four P4 engines on it. This is special silicon that can do packet processing right where the packet lands on the network card. When you read about this and learn about, you know, the processing that a Pensando DPU can do, you see that it has its own operating system. You see that it has its own management network interface. You see that it communicates with the network and the rest of the system, uh, you know, on the network side through, you know, a good old fashioned network interface, but on the system side through PCIe. And because the packet engine is already there, and because it's basically a standalone machine, and because Docker as a platform has stuff for managing Docker on remote computers, it's really not that much work to write a script and a few little helper things that will manage SSL on the actual DPU. So think about those containers that are running here managing SSL. We just take those off of the host system and we stick them on the network card. And it literally runs on the network card and you have the same man management tools and everything else. This slide, this Azure slide, this is exactly what Microsoft is talking about with managing this in Azure. This is their ability to move from 30 cores of usage to just eight because all of that load is handled on specialist hardware that's designed for it, but transparently to the software that they're using to manage their infrastructure. So we disaggregated it. We built a, an appliance together. Um, it gets 18 million uh, CPS today uh, with a 300 million packets per second. And when we say 18 million plus CPS, that's under the most extreme load, one that doesn't even exist in the world today. Think about something like Suricata. I mean, it's a very deep packet inspection, firewall, security monitoring, traffic analysis. It's amazing. But you can run that on the P4 engine? Yeah, you totally can. It's a many, many, many layer software thing. This was the mind blowing thing confirmed by the guys from Microsoft Azure. It's Pensando's implementation of this, the throughput is always steady. It doesn't matter what load you put upon it, whether it's CPS or PPS, everything is low latency, low jitter. Jitter usually measured in nanoseconds. I mean, DPDK is already well supported if you're already, you know, sort of clued into this part of the world. Now suppose, suppose I needed something more complex than the highest end firewall packet processing thing that we can do here. And the P4 processor is not gonna cut it. Enter Xilinx. Actually one of the demo white papers from Xilinx is SSL offload like we were starting in the beginning using an FPGA. But I've got an even better demo for you. FFmpeg on an FPGA. So let's say that we're gonna take our 128 core machine and do some video processing with it. Well, I mean, you can do that with your CPU, sure, sure. But an FPGA would probably be a little bit more efficient or you could put six or eight of them or 16 of them in a single machine because you got all that PCIe connectivity. Again, you can define really complicated hardware stuff in software and bring that to your software defined infrastructure. And you actually eliminate a lot of appliances. You don't need, you know, Cisco's highest end stuff. You don't need F5 networks. You don't need any Palo Alto devices. And that's exactly what HP Enterprise is doing with the new Aruba Smart Switch. This is a switch, but it's also got these P4 packet engines built in. That's what the P's are. They're, they're protocol agnostic packet processors. People need security built in to the networking equipment from day one. And as we thought about what was needed in the data center, we realized that there was an opportunity to partner with AMD Pensando to develop a new class of top of rack switch. We call it the distributed services switch or smart switch. You can do hardware firewall, load balancing, encryption offload, software defined WAN in the switch transparently communicating with the physical network card in your server or workstation 
and run everything with your software defined infrastructure as code system. I mean, you don't want to be beholden to Amazon to build out your distributed computing platform. You can do this with standardized infrastructure. And to be sure, even P4 is a relatively standardized processing system. AMD doesn't have a monopoly on that architecture, which is really good if you're looking to avoid vendor lock-in. Look at that, inventing in the industry and it's just ready to go. As a developer, I don't have to worry too much about all of this infrastructure plumbing. I can just do my application and define it in software. And if, okay, if I don't have an accelerator, I can depend on CPUs to do it. But the fact that it's pegging CPUs, just moving a few hundred billion bytes around, well, okay, you can use an accelerator. I mean, that makes sense. Accelerators, 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 accelerators. The software defined part of it lets your developers focus on their actual application, but there's another benefit. The fact that you're using silicon designed specifically for packet manipulation also means that you've got extremely low jitter. I mean, all this sounds complex, but it would actually be better if you can handle more of this at a lower level in hardware than at the software level. The overall application will perform better. I mean, you don't want to paint yourself into a corner when it comes to the software aspect of this and I'm sure we've all experienced situations where, you know, it's something weird happened and it became a storm of just the right conditions to cause everything to basically grind to a halt. But with the P4 type processor in the mix, the chances of that is happening, happening is much, much less. And that's what we mean when we talk about jitter. It's like the time between the average request and the worst case request, the slowest request time, those numbers are much, much closer together than you would get on a pure software solution because just copying packets over the network can peg an individual CPU core, even if you've got 128 of them. And 100 gigabit, this is only the beginning. I mean, 100 gigabit is, is basically old hat. What about 400 gigabit, 800 gigabit? Uh, as we saw with this simple file copy, this has to be handled more intelligently. And while your application might not be able to run with 100 gigabit today, 100 times performance requires you to completely turn the way you do networking upside down. This is the whole reason that DMA was originally invented in the 1980s, is to make sure that the CPU servicing all of the I.O. wasn't the bottleneck and wasn't overwhelmed. And now even with RDMA, I.O. is so wide that the non-work that the CPU is still doing is still overwhelmed. And so with the DPU in the equation, that's not gonna be the case because the DPU is doing the reassembly and all of the computation to just do those large blocks of data copies over the PCIe bus into memory. And so we're, we're back to a point where the CPU is not really super pegged. This is so slick and impressive to go from 30 cores to just eight cores right in front of us, it's here but you don't have to use a cloud service provider in order to get it. You can just add this to your own infrastructure. I could deploy this for the Level 1 Text website with Nginx and everything good to go right now today. And that's the, the really exciting part. Literally just buy a relatively inexpensive accelerator and shove it in there. I could buy a, a, a tier of processor less expensive if I'm sure what I'm doing will actually run on the Pensando DPU. This is kind of a game changer and why I was so excited to put my thinking together in this video. I mean, okay, there is a little bit of an overlap with Xilinx when we talk about SSL offloading and that sort of functionality, but that is your path to even more complication. So like when you embrace this and you use this for just bog standard packets on the network, and then you really want to leverage even fancier stuff for your software defined infrastructure, the FPGAs that are also in the product stack will let you do that. And that's why Pensando plus Xilinx acquisition for AMD is so big, especially when we're talking about this in the context of 128 core CPUs and 12 channels of memory bandwidth. All of this coming together makes an insanely powerful cloud computing solution, whether you're running your own cloud or using someone else's. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level 1 forum.